nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Maxi Seminar. Uh, it's a great honor for me today to introduce Professor John Sutherland from Purdue University for to speak in our Maxi Seminar. So Dr. Um, John Sutherland is one of the world's leading authorities on application of sustainability, sustainability principles to industrial issues. He has made many pioneering research and education contributions and provided in the leadership in establishing and uh, advancing the field of environmentally responsible design and manufacturing. He has served as an investigator on over 90 ex externally funded projects, valued in excess of $60 million. He has mentored approximately 100 students to the completion of their graduate degrees, including 27 PhD students. He has published nearly 400 papers in various journals and conference proceedings and is a course of the textbook. Statistical quality control and uh, uh, statistical quality design and control contemporary concept and methods. Um, Professor Sutherland is the head of environmental and ecological engineering or EEE at Purdue University. Um, EEE has the undergrad and graduate degree programs and is the one of the largest environmental engineering program in the country. Uh, and EEE is the unique as a department in that it embraces uh, industrial sustainability in addition to classic environmental engineering. Um, so there's a link in our flyer about the department. If you're interested, please refer to that link. And Professor Sutherland's honors and recognitions include the SME Outstanding Young Manufacturing Engineer Award in 1992, a Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers in 1996, SAE, SAE Rough Art Theater Educational Award in 1999, SME Educational Award in 2009, SAE International John Connor Environmental Award in 2010. ESME William T. Anner Manufacturing Technology Award in 2013, and SME Gold Award. Uh, Professor Sutherland is the fellow of SME, ESME, and SERP. And uh, one very important note to make, Professor Sutherland received his uh, old degrees, bachelor, master, and PhD degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. All right, so now please join me to welcome the speaker, Professor Sutherland, to talk about uh, uh, manufacturing for a sustainable future. Well, thank you, Professor Xiao. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it is indeed an honor to be, uh, I, I will say virtually, uh, giving this sen seminar. And uh, I can remember uh, as a student uh, uh, attending many of these seminars, so it's always great to give back. So. I put together a few ideas and hopefully try to give some uh, some things to everyone today that they can think about. So again, uh, uh, some of you may be asking, uh, why is uh, a graduate of uh, MEC-C, um, currently head of environmental and ecological engineering at Purdue? So hopefully I'll be able to answer that question and uh, uh, again, give you a few things to think about today. Um, I'll just start by suggesting that we are uh, facing many challenges around the world today. Um, these, in many cases, relate to the environment or how we use resources. Uh, we know that uh, uh, we have challenges in terms of uh, uh, climate change, and and uh, uh, that's being produced uh through our actions as, as humans. Uh, water is a growing concern. Um, we have a little image here. This is actually a Foxconn facility that uh, uh, they had to put up nets outside the windows because people were committing suicide. And I wanna talk at least broadly today about uh, what we can do as mechanical engineers or manufacturing engineers about some of these challenges. Um, as, as kind of a way to get into this issue, uh, let me suggest the following, that traditionally we have a production facility um, that many of us are in, involved in helping to design and, and run. Um, such a facility produce, of course it consumes resources and it produces waste. And then Historically, what we have done is we've asked 
environmental engineers to develop engineering systems to uh, stop that waste from, or at least uh, reduce the amount of waste that is uh, emitted to the environment. Um, we recognize that um, waste passing on to the environment uh, uh, essentially is pollution. Uh, so we can have water pollution, air pollution, uh, contaminate our soil. And environmental engineers' role is traditionally to, to do something about that waste. Um, they contain it, control it, treat it, mitigate it. Um, but they don't actually ever make the waste go away. Um, there has historically been little attention devoted to uh, reducing the waste or avoiding waste entirely. Think about the classes that are offered in MEXC, how many of them are focused on um, designing engineering systems to produce less waste. Uh, rather, we focus on performance, time, cost, these sorts of things, less emphasis on on what we can do to reduce the amount of waste. But I don't think it's uh, uh, going to be possible for um, environmental engineers to uh, go after the, the root causes of these waste streams because they simply do not uh, have the domain expertise to do that. The waste is created in the production facility. Uh, that's where the resources are consumed. And it's only through the actions of mechanical uh, manufacturing and other engineers that we can go after these, these sources of waste. Um, I'd like to suggest that everyone should be doing a lot more these days to better use the, the resources that we do have in terms of material and uh, uh, energy carriers. So with that brief introduction to the notion of the environment and who really is responsible for creating that waste in the first place. And it's not the environmental engineers, it's all the other engineering disciplines and managers and that sort of thing. Let me also just comment here on sustainability because this is a word that we hear a lot. Uh, I've, I've listed or, or displayed the Brundtland definition of sustainability. Um, one of the things that you can uh, extract from that definition is this emphasis on thinking about the future. We don't want to do things today that will uh, make our uh, situation in the future more and more difficult to, uh, to deal with. We want to take actions today that uh, will allow future generations to have the same opportunities we have today. Um, my colleague Jim Mahelsik uh, and I, as, as, as well as a few other colleagues, came up with the second definition below. And again, there's an emphasis on the future and uh, trying to uh, design and utilize engineering systems uh, so that we do not uh, irreparably harm our, our opportunities in the future. I think as we be, look at those two definitions, we begin to get some sense of this notion that we need to be operating in a way now that will allow us uh, to have the same opportunities in the future that we have today. So that means we need to think about three different systems. We need to think about the environment, we need to think about our society, which exists in the environment and relies on the environment, and then the economy or industry, uh, which exists as part of society. I've also uh, shown a, a, a definition or a, a statement from former Senator Gaylord Nelson, who uh, was a pioneer in, in uh, pushing through Earth Day, uh, many, many years ago, about 50, 51 years ago, as I recall. Um, and basically, he suggested that, uh, the that all the economic activity that we uh, uh, enjoy is entirely dependent upon the environment. And if we damage the environment, then that will 
undermine our our economic opportunities. So he began he begins to make this link between what we're doing uh, in terms of the economy and the environment. So sustainability basically means that as we move into the future, we need to give some thought to what we are doing now and what the consequences will be in terms of the environment, in terms of society, in terms of the economy. And I think we've done a pretty good job over the years in terms of thinking about the economy. And we've made tremendous progress over the last 30, 40 years in terms of the environment. Uh, we're only now starting to think a little bit more about uh, society as engineers and, and what we should be doing as engineers to um, ensure that we do not damage our societal structures. I like to think about sustainability as consisting of uh, a triple uh, bottom line, three dimensions to sustainability, three pillars, if you will. Um, economics, environment, again, and society or the social dimension. And you begin to see some of the things that we think about with respect to these three dimensions. I've also shown on this picture, sometimes we use this word sustainability. Um, I took uh, several controls classes while I was at um, Illinois. And uh, Something that is sustainable basically means that we have a stable situation moving into the future. Um, if something is not sustainable, that basically means that we are um, uh, increasing uh, exponentially, or I suppose it could be eroding exponentially. Uh, basically, uh, if you look at this behavior, it can't continue along that path forever. Uh, we will uh, enter some other uh, situation because it uh, it is not uh, stable. It is not sustainable. So come back to where we are right now with a few definitions out of the way. Um, the graph in the top left, I, I pulled off the, the Internet. I had one I on there before that was uh, a little dated. Basically, at present, we need um, about two times the resources um, as a global society uh, to function uh, with the current situation. The U.S. actually needs five Earths. If everyone on Earth lived like us in the United States, we'd need five Earths. Um, but Globally, the average is about two Earths uh, when we consider all our lifestyles collectively. Um, sometimes we think about this uh, challenge in terms of what we call the iPad equation. Impact equals population times affluence times technology. This uh, I learned about it from Gradle and Allenby back uh, in the early 1990s. And basically, the, the idea is that impact is the population times affluence times uh, impact. And uh, let's, let's think about that. So basically, our impact right now is double where we need to be to be sustainable. And as we look into the future, the population may go up by another 50% in the next 30, 40 years. Affluence is likely to go up by a factor of three or four when we think about the GDP per capita. And so that means that uh, 30, 40 years from now, we could uh, have, we might need globally 10 times the number of Earths that we have right now uh, to support our lifestyle or perhaps even 20. Uh, that is unless we do something about the impact, the impact per economic unit, uh, impact per dollar perhaps. Um, we're all really smart engineers, but trying to improve uh, this impact or reduce the impact by a factor of 10 over the next 30, 40 years is very challenging. To kind of see what that means, uh, let's consider carbon emissions. And again, this, this graph is a little dated, but I think that's okay. Um, here on the left is the atmospheric concentration of CO2. This is where we are. Uh, if we think about kind of a 1990s technology, maybe we're a little better than that. 
this is uh, uh, what the atmospheric concentration will look like if we kind of uh, have a greener energy mix. Uh, the scientists, the atmospheric scientists say that what we should be doing is trying to follow this gray line. Now, if we want to follow that gray line and, and kind of get on an asymptotic uh, trajectory to uh, stay at 550 parts per million in terms of CO2, um, then this is what needs to happen over here in terms of carbon emissions. So this is kind of the 1990s. This is the greener energy mix. And you can see that when we do that, we continue to pump CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, but what uh, we need to be doing is following this, this gray line in terms of emissions if we want to be on this uh, asymptotic trajectory. That is indeed a, a big challenge, and many believe that we need to be taking tremendous steps in terms of um, improving how we use our resources, um, what we design, how we design it, how we realize it, if we're going to transition from this kind of business as usual uh, path and instead move to something like this. All right. So that's kind of the background um, uh, in a big picture way. Um, sometimes we talk about sustainable manufacturing, which I hate as a phrase because we're not trying to sustain manufacturing. We're trying to do the things that um, in manufacturing that help us be sustainable. And according to the NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, we should be thinking about sustainability in terms of both products as well as manufacturing, uh, designing products that have a minimum environmental impact, and probably we should be thinking very carefully about the products themselves and whether they're a good idea in the first place, but that's perhaps a, a dis discussion for another day. But of course, then we also need to be thinking about how we're realizing these products. Are we are we developing manufacturing processes and systems uh, that have uh, minimum environmental impact? I like thinking about this uh, sustainability problems in turn of, uh, turn, terms of that picture there on the right. Um, we, uh, as a society, extract uh, resources from the environment. Um, we have industrial systems, designers, manufacturing folks that... Uh, take those resources, make them into products and services where they are used by society. Um, we, do, we know from our time in, in uh, science class in, in high school that uh, there are natural system decomposers that can take the waste that society produces or that the industrial systems produce and return those, uh, uh, those uh, wastes back to minerals and nutrients. But at present, the uh, rate at which we are um, taking resources from the earth and making them into goods and services um, is, is far outstripping the ability of the natural system to break them back down into resources for the environment. That is not sustainable. And uh, uh, clearly this is a big problem. Uh, manufacturing has just... Uh, uh, one of many uh, disciplines that has, has a role in, in terms of trying to um, transition this uh, way that we're using the resources and, and move toward a situation that is more sustainable. All right, so I, I mentioned, uh, and it came up at the outset, that I am a product of, of the University of Illinois. My background is in industrial uh, and mechanical engineering, manufacturing. Um, and after graduating from the University of Illinois, um, I started my faculty career. And one of the first things I got involved with was some engineers at Ford. And we were talking about cutting fluids. And uh, I, had, I had taught a manufacturing course at, at Illinois for years as a graduate student. And then as a postdoc, and uh, I knew all about what the functions and benefits of cutting fluids were because it's in the textbook, cooling and lubrication, you flush, through, flush away the chips, uh, 
put some oil coating on the, the workpiece uh, that uh, inhibits corrosion, protects the machine tool, uh, extends tool life, and all these other wonderful benefits of cutting fluid. But of course, when very often when we were running our, our uh, running tests in our lab, we weren't using cutting fluid. We just uh, figure out a way to do everything dry because cutting fluids were a mess. But at any rate, the, the situation with Ford was that uh, they were one of many companies using millions of gallons of fluid every year. And uh, they were acutely aware of the, the environmental challenges. The fluid would drip on the ground, contaminate the soil. Um, there were health effects. People were concerned about uh, uh, dermatitis and cutting fluid mist inhalation. And, of course, from, from a company standpoint, there was tremendous costs associated with these things. So I'll just note that uh, uh, health was a big concern associated with the cutting fluids. A um, uh, large number of people were exposed, being exposed to cutting fluids, um, increasing attention to um, the aerosols, aerosolized cutting fluids. Um, there's ever-tightening workplace standards in terms of uh, allowable airborne particulate that workers could be exposed to. Um, some, of, uh, some of my colleagues, um, graduate students and, and others, had been exposed to toxins that might be in the cutting fluid and they developed lung ailments and so forth and there were high profile lawsuits so there were many concerns associated with with uh, health uh, linked to cutting fluids uh, i mentioned the environmental challenges um, and of course from ford's standpoint it was uh, costly as well um, the traditional approach for dealing with with cutting fluids and of course this would be the environmental engineering approach or the uh, industrial hygiene approach would be to install mist collectors and filters and to capture the fluid and to better manage the system and to uh, if you want the fluid to perform better we can add additives to it and emulsifiers and deodorants and so forth because it stinks um, they couldn't just get rid of the fluid if they were uh, uh, wanted to to discard it they had to pre-treat it before they could discharge it to the treatment works and all these approaches with how the the fluid system was being managed with how the cutting fluids were being managed was was never going after the real problem which was in fact the use of the cutting fluids in the first place and so since i approached this problem from a, a manufacturing standpoint i said well why are we using the cutting fluids in the first place? Well, we began investigating that, and we ran hundreds and hundreds of tests, all sorts of different um, processes, cylinder boring, milling, drilling, so forth, uh, developed all sorts of sophisticated uh, mechanistic models to describe the role of cutting fluids in terms of heat transfer and lubrication, how does it affect the, affect the uh, distortion of, of products and fixturing systems and machine tools? Um, essentially, we wanted to try to better mechanistically understand the role that cutting fluids uh, have in terms of performance. And we were able to develop the data and, and use the models to make a case to Ford that they could move away from, from using this high-volume flood-type cooling to either dry or very dry or damp um, machining applications. So essentially, migrate away from, from, from cutting fluids uh, to uh, situations where we perhaps uh, employ minimum quantity lubrication. Um, what was the benefit? Well, it turns out that in addition to uh, moving away from using cutting fluids, uh, uh, as being a benefit in terms of the environment, in terms of health. Uh, fluid costs uh, were about 20% uh, of the non-material related costs in the production facility. Here you can see the pie chart showing the breakdown. Um, fluid costs, purchasing the fluid, it was actually more expensive to treat used fluid than to purchase new, new fluid. Uh, they had the mist collectors, they had 
increased uh, uh, housekeeping because the fluid would, uh, uh, again, there would be air more particulate. It would settle on the floor, make the floor slippery, so they'd have to wash the floor more frequently. I mentioned the filtering systems, recirculation systems. So it was all very expensive. And so they were able to move away from these uh, uh, use of fluids and, and save tremendous money in the process. So, a couple things. Um, this was m one of my first entrees into this area of being environmentally responsible uh, in terms of manufacturing. And one of my takeaways was that it was always going to be very difficult for environmental engineers to really address this problem because they do not have the domain expertise to go after the root cause. The root cause in this case being the fact that we're using cutting fluids in the first place. We also saw that, that uh, the, one of the lessons learned here was that um, thinking about these kinds of challenges in a more uh, system oriented way allows us to um, go after these root causes of the waste and make better choices in terms of how we use material and energy. Uh, can we, rather than reducing an environmental problem or reducing a health problem, can we completely avoid it or eliminate it? And of course, because we're approaching these things from uh, a solid engineering standpoint, we're always looking for opportunities to either save money or, or to uh, seize, seize upon some, some profitable opportunity. All right. So um, very good. So I want to kind of shift gears here a little bit and talk about, um, again, I'll take you back a number of years. And um, this is what we used to talk about as being the product life cycle. Um, and some of you, and it's an old, old figure, but that's okay. Um, we essentially, with products, extract uh, ores from the ground. We process that into engineering materials such as steel or aluminum. We then manufacture those, take those materials, make them uh, with manufacturing into products that we distribute, we use, and then ultimately dispose. It's all driven by design. Uh, design drives manufacturing, which essentially serves as a pull to uh, materials extraction, materials processing. We call this a product life cycle, but there really isn't a cycle. It's one way. Every step in this chain uh, produces waste that ultimately is disposed, is landfilled, is, uh, goes back into the environment. And uh, sometimes I ask the students uh, uh, who's responsible for creating such, this, such a system. Well, society is responsible. It's our system. Um, we own this system. Uh, we tolerate this system. Waste is produced as part of the system. Waste is designed in. Uh, we live with a situation where uh, used products are discarded. Maybe there's not much wrong with them, but we discard them anyway. Uh, and again, we just accept this system as part of uh, this kind of a natural thing. This is how we how we operate, it's just part of doing business. I think we need to transition to a situation where we are more focused on closing these material loops. Uh, we design, of course, it all starts with design. If you don't design the product correctly, then many of things, these things become very difficult. Um, we need to be thinking about waste at every step in the process and doing what we can to extract maximum value from the materials, from the resources, from the energy. Um, there's an opportunity for maintenance. People talk about smart manufacturing, smart maintenance, intelligent ma maintenance. Maintenance is critical. We have end of life products that we recover. Um, what are we doing? What are we doing with them? Are we reusing them? Are we remanufacturing them? Um, lots of opportunities for new technologies here to help close these material 
loops, uh, capture value. Uh, we may need new business models, likely need new business models that support this approach. Can we sell use rather than selling the product itself? And these days, while we started talking about this perhaps in the late 80s, early 90s, um, on the engineering side, over the last uh, six, seven, uh, ten years, people have begun talking much more about the circular economy. Uh, so it's not just engineers anymore thinking about closing these material loops. Now it's policymakers, economists, and so forth. So, so this is kind of a, an emerging trend that we need to be thinking about, uh, thinking about in terms of manufacturing, in terms of uh, design. So that background kind of sets up this next discussion. Uh, we talked about this tremendous kind of carbon challenge, if you will, and what can we do to be uh, uh, much more responsible in terms of how we use uh, energy. And one strategy for, for using a lot less fossil fuel is to uh, look at uh, renewable energy generation and electrifying uh, the transportation sector. Um, Many of these, these technologies, such as wind turbines and EVs, um, rely on what we call critical materials. And these are special materials that uh, have uh, very specialized properties. And they are termed critical because they, uh, uh, not because there, there are uh, limited amounts, but because they tend to be geographically concentrated and subject to supply risk. And so the graph on the far right um, just shows you some of those kind of critical materials um, that uh, are important in terms of clean energy technologies and that are potentially a little risky from a supply chain standpoint. Where are we going to come up with these things? And it turns out that some of these things, like the rare earth elements, like lithium, like cobalt, um, are really important from um, a clean energy technology standpoint. We need uh, uh, neodymium and dysprosium for rare earth permanent magnets, and we are aware of the fact that lithium and cobalt are uh, very important for uh, EV batteries. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, some of the things that we're involved with here uh, in this clean energy technology area, and then uh, just kind of uh, uh, maybe cover one other topic before we uh, wrap up for this morning. So um, a couple graphs here, nice. Not too many equations today, so that's good. I just had that iPad equation. So um, the graph here on the little picture here on the right just shows you that where we're using rare earths, and a big chunk of the rare earths are associated with magnets, and these are the magnets that are um, found in, in uh, uh, generators and, and motors, EV motors, uh, e-bikes, um, and here on the, the, the right, you can see where uh, these rare earth oxides are coming from. Um, going back a few years, they were almost all coming from China. That is changing a little bit. It's changing because uh, people are, are concerned about um, uh, where we're getting the uh, rare earth from and who's doing the processing. If all of a sudden there is um, some political issue with China, then, then that could jeopardize uh, many of these products. You can see that China is still a major source or the major source for rare earth oxides. Um, they also are, are uh, the big player in terms of the processing of those oxides into the actual elements. Um, the, the bar graph in the bottom shows you what has happened to the neodymium oxide price over time. Uh, there was a spike because of a trade uh, dispute back in 2011. And as we look into the future, you can see there's rising uh, prices for um, the rare earths. Why? Because the, there's such a growing demand for products made from these things. So demand is growing quickly. 
the supply cannot really keep up with it. So the result will be uh, an increase in price. Uh, just to illustrate, uh, um, you know, some of the products that are using a lot of these uh, uh, rare earth permanent magnets. I've got the graph here in the bottom right, which is taken from uh, Schultz et al. And uh, the orange one uh, is e-bikes. And I believe that that includes uh, scooters that we see around many college campuses. Um, you see that there's an increasing uh, uh, desire to use um, these rare earth permanent magnet motors, um, uh, uh, which have a variety of applications. Um, some of the other applications, you can just see them picking up. Um, uh, including traction motors for uh, EVs and, and hybrids, um, but it's also in wind turbines and, and other applications. In fact, one of the uh, largest uh, applications of, of rare earth permanent magnets historically has been in hard disk drives. So. One other, uh, one thing I need to remind us all of, and perhaps it's not remind, perhaps it's uh, just mentioned it in the first place, um, two, two concepts here, remanufacturing versus recycling. Um, remanufacturing uh, endeavors to capture the functional value in a used product, uh, while recycling takes a used product and often uh, chops it up and tries to just recover the material value. Um, both serve to close material loops, but uh, uh, recycling does not get all that uh, investment that we make into a product um, as a product, the functional value of the product. Uh, remanufacturing does that. And again, I'll, I'll just highlight that uh, it's a whole lot easier to remanufacture product if it was designed uh, to be remanufactured in the first place. One of the things we did for our friends over in Peoria a while back was to work with them um, to help make a case for the opportunities for remanufacturing their diesel engine and just articulate the environmental benefits of that. And it turns out that not only is remanufacturing very profitable for Caterpillar Profit margin is very, very good, helps them retain customers, but it's a wonderful thing in terms of the environment. It takes about a tenth of the energy and therefore a tenth of the uh, CO2 footprint to remanufacture a diesel engine um, as opposed to uh, starting from scratch and, and uh, making a new one. Um, you can't, ultimately, you're going to have to make new engines but uh, and and it's enabled by the fact that uh, uh, the diesel engine is not uh, uh, evolving very quickly in terms of technology so um, not like a cell phone or some of the other uh, electronic products so that that does help um, I know for example that Cummins uh, designs their diesel engines for seven use cycles as I recall I like this picture. This picture just shows uh, what happens to value uh, over time as I, uh, uh, as we uh, take materials and process it into a product uh, and then uh, allow that product to be used. Uh, we come to a decision point here where we have several options, perhaps remanufacture, allow this uh, ref notice that remanufacture uh, restores the value to new or better than new. Reuse continues to allow that product uh, value to degrade. Recycling actually destroys value. And then as you sort it and, and uh, purify the, the various components of the uh, recycling stream, uh, you get value back. And of course, we know that disposal actually is a negative value. It, it harms society, harms, harms the environment. So I'll just mention that uh, uh, we're working very closely with the Critical Materials Institute, uh, and uh, we're working with a number of scientists from the Department of Energy on a number of different issues. Um, primarily, our role has been to help them in terms of the, this third step, with the third strategy that they have, which is looking at uh, recovering value 
from various streams, whether they be product or or uh, one of the various waste streams associated with materials processing and manufacturing. And our efforts have focused on trying to look at life cycle assessment and uh, techno-economic analysis. Um, here you, I'll just give you a couple of examples. Uh, um, we worked with a company on magnet to magnet recycling, uh, worked with Oak Ridge on uh, dismantling and, and uh, uh, remanufacturing of a traction motor. And again, our, our primary role has been to, uh, to support some of the various technologies that have been proposed by the scientists and try to make some assessment about whether or not they, uh, they make sense economically or environmentally. And I don't want to get too bogged down in this. This is, uh, uh, what's the old uh, course, industrial economics, uh, industrial economy. Uh, That's why these courses are important. You know, you can help help the scientists make better economic decisions. Um, here's one example where we did this for looking at uh, um, various types of waste and uh, whether or not it makes sense to recover uh, recover rare earth from that and it turns out that uh, it was a very favorable situation looking at the kind of the break even uh, the, the kind of the price increase that is needed to break even and it turns out that coal ash was was very promising uh, because actually the the current price would would make it all uh, make sense economically we also from our techno economic and uh, assessment learned that uh, a lot of the pre-processing steps are the, the expensive steps, and, and that then points the way toward doing, uh, looking at other, other opportunities. Where, where can we save in terms of the cost? Um, here's another one that we looked at. Uh, this was on fluid cracking catalysts and comparing bioleaching versus chemical leaching. And again, in this case, uh, um, bioleaching was very favorable in all, almost all categories. Uh, uh, compared kind of to the uh, uh, best uh, existing technology being the chemical leaching. Just point the way here to try to illustrate why we need to be thinking more about uh, um, closing these material loops and why, the, uh, why we should be thinking much more about uh, where these resources are going to be coming from. The projected demand, and this is just for HEVs, hybrids, um, that's this orange graph. And uh, this is kind of where, where the history has been on these things. Um, think about what this means in terms of this growing demand. And this is, again, just for the hybrids. The battery uh, EVs look uh, even more challenging. Um, but you can start thinking, well, can we use some of the, this on-road inventory of these um, rare earths that are in these existing uh, hybrids, can we use them out here uh, you know, 12, 15 years later to, to meet the needs of, of uh, hybrids going into the future? Um, in, in this case, for hybrids, it doesn't look too awful bad because it turns out that perhaps at some point in the future here we can meet uh, um, anywhere from from 40 to 50 percent of the demand uh, assuming we could recover all those things uh, all the rare earths um, batteries it doesn't look nearly as favorable but it it does help to mitigate some of the uh, uh, pressure placed on the virgin resources um, I'll just show this. Uh, this is from my colleagues at uh, 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 MIT a few years ago, and it just shows uh, a plot of, of using um, value displayed on, on the vertical axis, material value in a product, and, the, and the, the complexity of the product in terms of the materials that are embedded within it. Um, here you can see some simple products down here. Um, they're, they're simple, but there's some value. Steel can has, has value, uh, and it's not complex. Um, catalytic converter, refrigerator, automobile, um, they all have uh, value in terms of materials. There are other products that uh, uh, have less value, and uh, 
um, what our colleagues, uh, uh, Tim Gutowski and his student, Jeff Damas, uh, showed was that there is this kind of apparently apparent recycling boundary. Um, and so the reason I bring this up is, is that uh, this really may help us uh, prioritize certain products that uh, we should be focusing on in terms of recycling. A couple of things to think about in terms of, of this. Um, they didn't, they weren't too rigorous about defining the boundary. We've made some progress on that recently. Uh, it was a smaller data set. And so, again, we've expanded on that recently. Um, there's some thinking that, well, maybe it's not just product complexity. In some cases, it, it a lot depends upon how uh, easy it is to recover these things. Uh, we have systems in place to uh, collect automobiles and you can't just let your uh, refrigerators queue up in your home as you use them um, or your tires or your automobile batteries. So we do have systems in place to capture some of these things. Uh, on the other hand, cell phones, they you know, perhaps uh, uh, we haven't been too good historically at doing something with them. They're fairly complex and, and uh, uh, the designers have done a good job of, of trying to minimize the material so there's not a lot of value in the material. Um, I'll also note that this graph just focuses on recycling, no, no discussion of, of remanufacturing. So again, we've, we've tried to expand on that, look, looked at things beyond um, just uh, complexity and thinking more about recovery, and, and we used uh, machine learning to, to more rigorously define some of these boundaries. All right, so I want to just capture this, and then we'll talk about one last thing, and then we'll wrap up here. Um, need to think, be thinking a lot more about decarbonization. All these clean energy technologies rely on critical materials. Um, everyone should be thinking about the product life cycle and new technologies, new business models. What can we do to close the loop um, to dematerialize society? Because it's really the use of these materials that uh, drives a lot of the wastes. Um, remanufacturing is better than recycling if we can make it happen. Um, course you can't remanufacture something if if the value is completely destroyed all right one last issue and i just you know i when we were discussing what to talk about in the seminar you know uh i thought well let me let me just mention this um so i mentioned at the outset that three three pillars of sustainability economy environment and society or the social dimension. And manufacturing is all about people. Uh, it's about jobs. And I think, and I'll, we can talk about it when, when I wrap up here, um, companies are often talking and trumpeting the tremendous benefit they, they offer to uh, society. Um, perhaps uh, if we go up to Grand Rapids, there's, competition among uh, different companies about the neat things they can do for the city of Grand Rapids. Um, I got to thinking, you know, what, how are we measuring these things? And, you know, what, what good metrics do we have to uh, judge uh, the relative merit of a what something a company does? Uh, we also know that uh, developing nations oftentimes trade off the environment for economic and social good. Uh, and I, hopefully everyone's fam familiar with the sustainable development goals uh, of the UN. And as you look at those goals, a big chunk of them relate to society. So social issues, incredibly important. We know this increasingly over the the last uh, uh, 12, 14 months, uh, just incredibly important. Um, and engineers have a, a role to play with respect to these social issues, just like everyone else. So a um, number of years ago, I had a student that was interested in, she was a mechanical engineer, but she wasn't really interested in any of the traditional mechanical engineering things. So I said, well, why don't you look at this, this issue of social. And 
we began looking at, you know, the inputs and outputs to a business, to a manufacturing company, and, you know, there are physical things and people things and information finances that all go into a business. And some of those things relate to, and then they, they come out and then some of those things relate to social dimension. Um, some companies, and there are reporting uh, strategies out there that can talk about uh, a company can report on what they're doing with respect to society and social issues, but it tends to be pretty qualitative, subjective, not object, uh, not objective, but rather very subjective, uh, and things tend to not be auditable. So, um, what we'd like to see is something where we have kind of a social LCA that parallels the environmental LCA. Um, we have nice models that that talk about how uh, emissions can affect, uh, uh, can be measured and inventoried and how they can affect things like global warming, o ozone depletion, and ultimately uh, impact the environment. Uh, we don't really have a lot of the same things over here in terms of uh, a social LCA. It's a lot of questions and not many good indicators, not many good metrics. So that's, in fact, what this student worked on. She uh, uh, looked at the problem. Uh, who are the key stakeholders that we need to be thinking about if we're thinking about a business? Um, consumers, society, workers. Um, and then what do we need to be thinking about in terms of the needs of those various uh, stakeholders? And she used uh, Maslow's hierarchy to, to characterize those needs. Here is just the hierarchy for uh, individuals, but you can do this for groups as well. And we ended up identifying um, 30 uh, categories of kind of combination of needs and, and social groups uh, that were important. Um, and uh, we then performed a Delphi study to identify uh, the important indicators for each of those categories. And uh, just as one example, uh, um, we, uh, we're looking at for the uh, employee group at the basic level, we ended up with three kind of uh, promising indicators. And uh, for our, our Delphi study, uh, it turns out that uh, uh, there was a big difference between how these were ranked and uh, so it turns out that the employees below the poverty line, that was um, the, the most important indicator. And you can see that one uh, kind of shook out there. You can see the needs for some of these other, other areas as well. Um, employees uh, at some of the higher need levels. So hopefully all the faculty at Illinois are uh, above the poverty line and uh, likely have a lot of their safety and security uh, needs met. Um, some of the things the university probably needs to think about in terms of their employees are some of these higher order need levels. So you get some student did some nice work and we came up with some recommendations on some of these indicators. So let me just uh, 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 very quickly wrap up a couple of uh, takeaways associated with this. Social dimension, incredibly important, never more important than it is today. Um, much more thinking about equity, and, and I think that's a, a very positive thing. Um, the student uh, uh, who's at Sandia now um, did some nice work to come up with this framework and then Delphi study to identify these uh, uh, top top uh, indicators for each of these need categories. Uh, applied some nice statistics to to do that, um, and that's where we are.